Chapter 17 kicks off a three-chapter sequence focused on equilibria. Equilibria is different from the other big concepts like thermodynamics and kinetics in that it really focuses on will the reaction reach completion. In Chapter 17, we'll learn that chemical reactions are dynamic and reversible. And because of this reversibility, sometimes we have to first figure out in which direction the reaction will actually go. Next, when a reaction reaches equilibrium, we'll use some quantitative problem solving to determine what are the concentrations of the products and reactants at equilibrium. And lastly, if you start with a reaction at equilibrium and you disturb it, with an event, how is the new equilibrium reestablished? Equilibrium is a state of balance between opposing forces that can be static or dynamic. These pictures represent both static and dynamic equilibrium. The rocks on the left are static, but this waterfall here is dynamic. Chemical reactions reach dynamic equilibrium, just like this waterfall. If you focus on the pool of water circled in yellow, the net volume of this pool doesn't change, and therefore it's at equilibrium. And it's dynamic because there's water continuously flowing in and water continuously flowing out but that doesn't change the net volume. Chemical equilibrium is the final state reached by a chemical reaction when the net concentrations of reactants and products no longer change. In this picture where A converts to B over this time period, when we reach the final time where B is all formed and all of A has reacted away, this represents this final state. And if we were to take later time snapshots of this reaction, it would just look like the speaker at t equals 60 seconds. So let's just talk about chemical equilibria a little bit more generally. If you reach equilibrium, does it mean that all of A has reacted to give all of B? In other words, does a reaction reach 100% conversion? And does it mean then that when you reach chemical equilibria, that A stops turning into B? So let's pause just a little bit and think about, are these statements true or false based on this definition? The first statement is false. Not all reactions will proceed to 100%. Chemical equilibria just means it reaches a certain point where the net concentrations no longer change. It doesn't assume that it has to be 100%. In fact, it can be quite small. The second statement is also false. Remember that chemical equilibria is dynamic and chemical reactions are reversible. So even though we reach equilibrium, A still turns into B, and B still turns into A. So these reactions are constantly happening, but their net concentrations are the same because the forward rate and the reverse rate of this reaction are equal. So perhaps a more correct way to write a chemical reaction is not to use the single-headed arrow but to use this double arrow that represents equilibrium, showing that the reaction can move forward from A to B, as well as backwards from B to A. And this is a more correct depiction of this phenomenon. Reaction direction is an important concept in chemical equilibria. So in this example of a chemical reaction where A turns into B, at time zero, we start with all A. And as time passes and B is formed, we reach the time point where the net concentrations of A and B 
basically level out. They become constant. And so these last three beakers already represent an image of the reaction at equilibria. And you can see for this reaction, it does not attain 100% conversion, that there's still A remaining. And so when we specify this reaction direction, we say that the reaction proceeds from A to B. Another way of saying that is that it proceeds to product or because B is written on the right side of this chemical equation, we can also say that the reaction direction is to the right. Now, pay attention to these final levels here where this represents the equilibrium concentration of A and B. Because what if instead of starting with 100% A, I start with 100% B and no A? So at equilibrium, we still attain those final concentrations. These are the same values as before, but now we only have B decaying to that and A growing in. And so this reaction direction is actually to the left. Uh, because it is towards the reactant, which is on the left side of the equation. And so an important concept to remember that at equilibrium, and these are for a specific set of conditions, the concentrations of A and B will be the same, whether you start from A, whether you start from B, or even some mixture of A and B. For a specific reaction at a certain temperature, you will always get the same final equilibrium state no matter what your starting point is. This is extremely powerful because that means you have this consistency in the end result for the same reaction but under different starting conditions. And so you can specify what's called an equilibrium constant for a reaction at a certain temperature. Uh, so to show you where an equilibrium constant is defined, I'm going to use a few concepts from the definition and derive it. So remember that the concentrations of A and B at equilibrium are themselves constant. And I'll introduce this notation where bracket A EQ means the concentration of A at equilibrium. Another thing is that remember at equilibrium, the forward rate is equal to the reverse rate. And so I can write these set of equations where the rate going forward is equal to the rate in reverse. And then I can use the fact that these can be considered elementary reactions to rewrite rate as a product of a rate constant and the concentration of that reactant. So the rate going forward is the rate constant k forward times the concentration of A, and the rate in reverse is k reverse times the concentration of B. And again, just to remember that this is at equilibrium, I'm going to add the subscripts to indicate that on these concentrations. And then I'll rearrange this equation so that I collect a ratio of my rate constants and a ratio of my concentrations. And I can now define that the equilibrium constant for this reaction is really the ratio of the forward rate constant to the reverse rate constant. And that is equal to this ratio of concentrations where we have the product B on top and A, the reactant, on bottom. So Kc is the equilibrium constant, and it is this particular ratio of the product over reactant concentrations at equilibrium. And this will be an important equation in this chapter. More generally, you can define Kc for any complex chemical equation. So now we have 
to reactants A and B to products C and D and with different coefficients. So Kc then is still a ratio, but because of these constants, I'm going to add this qualifier that it's a particular ratio of equilibrium product and reactant concentrations at some specified temperature. And so this is a more general form for Kc, where I have my product concentration C and D on top, and these are raised to the power of the coefficients in the chemical equation. And on the bottom, I have my reactants A and B on concentrations that are also raised to the coefficients in the chemical equation. You can specify a equilibrium constant for all sorts of chemical reactions, and they can have vastly different values. Different chemical reactions can have greatly different values of equilibrium constants, or Kc. And so you can have lots of reactions that adhere to this simple formula of A turning into B, where they all have a Kc expression that is equal to the product B concentration over the reactant A concentration at equilibrium. So these beakers all represent different chemical reactions with very different values of Kc. And they are organized such that those on the left are majority reactant, or A, and those towards the right are majority product, or B. You can use these images to calculate what Kc is by taking the concentration of B over A. So in this first extreme here, we have only A and no B. So this is just a ratio of something very close to 0 to 1. And at the other extreme, we have only B and no A. So this becomes a ratio of 1 over 0. And so their corresponding Kc values are 0 all the way to infinity. And in the middle examples here, you can basically count the different A's and B's and assign concentrations, and you would get these ratios. And if you do the math, you would get these Kc values. And you can see that some are very small, and some are so high that they can approach infinity. It's nice to think about the continuum of Kc values that different reactions can have. And I like to think about it in three different categories. The first one where the Kc value is very small, for instance, something that is so close to zero or less than 10 to the minus fifth. You can also have intermediate values and you can have extremely large values where Kc is greater than 10 to the fifth. And so in these ranges, you can make assumptions that when it's very small, that basically the reaction mixture will be almost entirely all A at equilibrium. If it's very large, then the opposite is true, that the reaction mixture at equilibrium is almost entirely all B. In the intermediate range, you can have both A and B present, even if one is a majority. A related concept to the equilibrium constant is something called the reaction quotient, or Q. And we'll again focus on concentration, so it's Kc and Qc, but just for an abbreviation, I'm just going to refer to these as K versus Q. So the reaction quotient Q is a particular ratio of the concentrations of product and reactants. So for the simple reaction of 1A turning into 1B, mathematically we would write this expression for Q as being equal to the concentration of B over the concentration of A. So how is Q different from K? Well, remember that K is specifically equilibrium concentrations, whereas Q is not restricted to that.
So if you have a reaction at some temperature, the value of K is constant, but Q will change throughout the chemical reaction. And only when the reaction reaches equilibrium and stops, that's when the value of Q will equal to that of K because these concentrations will be the equilibrium concentrations. So here is a diagram showing a progression for a single reaction where Q can be any of these values starting with all A or starting with all B. And by taking this ratio of B over A, here are the different Q values. It can be zero and it can basically reach infinity. But for this reaction, there is only one value of K. And in this example, I've set it here to be 3.6. So this speaker represents chemical equilibrium. And so you can now have three different regions for Q along this continuum. You have a region where Q is less than K. You have a region where Q is exactly equal to K. And you can have a region where Q is greater than K. And so no matter where you start, you basically want Q to eventually reach the value of K because that is when you have chemical equilibrium and the net concentrations of the reactions stop changing. So coming back to this general equation of a chemical reaction, and we already presented what K is, um, it's really straightforward to say that Q is the same particular ratio, except that these are concentrations at any point of the chemical reaction. So one thing you might notice is depending on these coefficients, um, you can have different units. It turns out that both K and Q are unitless. So how is that possible? Technically, these are not specific concentrations, but something called an active concentration that's relative to a standard state concentration. So for solutions, the standard state would be one molar. So when we talk about the concentration of A, in actuality, if it's 1.5 molar in the solution, we divide that by the standard state for solutions, and we come up with a unit less numbers, 1.5, which is what we would plug in into these expressions for K and Q. Another thing to bear in mind is that pure solids and liquids will not appear in these K or Q expressions. And that is because you can change the weight or the volume of a pure solid or liquid, but the density of that solid and liquid isn't changing. And so their active concentrations remain one. When we have a chemical reaction of A turning to B, we can write the expressions for K and Q. But let's say we want to use these values to determine the corresponding K and Q values for another chemical reaction that's related to our base one. So for this example here, the base reaction is A turning into B. And we can use that then to solve for K and Q for the reaction in the reverse direction. Or maybe the reaction A to B is actually a sum of two individual reactions. And also we can have a multiplier um, where this reaction is multiplied by a factor of N. Now, these equalities for the related chemical reactions may look a little daunting at first. Both the expressions for K and Q are essentially identical. And this should make sense because both K and Q have the same expression form where you have product of concentrations over reactant concentrations. And 
The only difference is that K specifically uses concentrations at equilibrium. And because K and Q are almost equal, I'm just going to focus on the derivation based on Q. In the first example where this is a reaction run in the reverse direction, that means the reaction is B turned to A. So if you use the definition of Q, you would write that this is equal to the concentration of the product, A, over the concentration of the reactant, B. And this formula then is very related to the Q expression for the base reaction, A goes to B. In fact, these expressions are inverses of one another, and therefore QC of a reverse reaction is 1 over Q for the forward reaction. In this is next example, this is where the base reaction is a sum of individual reactions. And so for simplicity, I'll just limit it to two individual reactions, where let's say in reaction 1, A turns into C, and then in reaction 2, C turns into B. So the overall one is the space reaction up here. Now the expression for Q of the overall reaction will be the product of the Qs of the individual reaction. And so let's just write the Qs for the individual reactions. So here's Q for the first one where A turns into C, and here's the Q for the second one where C turns into B. And then if I follow this equality, that means the overall Q is equal to the product of these two Q expressions. And by taking the product, C drops out, and we're just left with B over A. And so that is a nice demonstration that this equality would work. In the last example, this is where we multiply the base reaction by a factor N. And so, for instance, it would be n molecules of A going to n molecules of B. If I were to write the Q expression for this reaction as written, the n would appear as powers. So this would be the concentration of B raised to the power n over the concentration of A raised to the power n. And I can just simplify this expression by collecting the powers and, and basically have B over A together raised to the power of N. And since B over A is the Q of the base reaction, I can write this as QC raised to the power N.